Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. Today is day three of our 90-day SAT preparation series. Today we'll be going through our second day where we do SAT math lessons, trying to teach you the basic equations that you need to know to be successful on the math section of the SAT. That's the no calculator section and the calculator section. So today we're going to review the equations that we learned yesterday, and then we'll get into some new ones that you'll need to put down into your notebook. So we'll start with the equations we reviewed yesterday. So the first equation that we had yesterday is the slope-intercept equation. So we've got slope-intercept equation. So if you remember, the slope-intercept equation is the form y equals mx plus b, y equals mx plus b, where b is our y-intercept and m is our slope. So if we have a positive slope, if our slope is positive, our graph will look like this. And if our slope is negative, then our graph will look like this, right? And our y-intercept is where our line crosses that y-axis, right? So right here. All right, our next equation that we had is the vertex form of a quadratic equation. So we've got our vertex form of a quadratic equation. You could also call it a parabola. So we'll go vertex form of a parabola. All right, so we have our vertex form of a parabola. That's going to be y is equal to a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k. And if we remember, our vertex is at the point h, k, right? So if our vertex is at a positive x value, right? So h is positive, we'll have x minus a number. Now, if our h is negative, so say our vertex was at the point for x negative 2, then we would have x plus 2 because we would have minus that negative 2, turning that to that x plus 2 and that, that part of the equation right there. We remember that if a is positive, then our graph is going to look like this. And if a is negative, our graph is going to look like this, right? We remember that k is our minimum if our graph looks like this right here. And we know that k is going to be our maximum if our graph is like this, right? So if a is negative, then k will be a maximum. And if a is positive, then k will be a minimum. All right, our next equation that we had was the distance formula. All right, so we have distance formula. We remember that we had two ways that we could think about the distance formula. We had, we could think of it as our distance, which we'll call D, being our rise squared plus our run squared underneath the square root. We can also think of it as our second x point minus our first x point squared plus our second y point minus our first y point squared underneath that square root is equal to our distance. So either way, that is your distance formula. Third equation that we had was the quadratic formula. So this is for finding your roots of a parabola or a quadratic equation. So you're going to have x is going to equal our negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So we remember that this gives us where our graph crosses that x-axis, right? So it gives us our x-intercepts, which are also called our zeros or our roots. So that is our quadratic equation. So the next equation that we learned is the exponents, right? We got into our exponents. We did all of our exponents with multiplying, dividing, and having a power raised to a power. So exponents, let's say we'll use a similar example to yesterday. We'll say we have z raised to the power of x, and we'll say we are multiplying that by z raised to the power of y. Well, that's going to equal z x plus y, right? Z to the power of x plus y. We add those exponents, but we remember that this only applies if our bases are the same. We see we have z and z, so it's going to work there. Now, if we have z to the x power, and then we are dividing that by z to the y power, we remember that we subtract, right? So we're going to end up with z x minus y. That's going to be our answer there. So we got those two rules. The next equation that we had was when we have a exponent raised to the power of an exponent. So let's say we have z raised to the power of x, and then we're raising that to the power of y. So when we do that, that means we're going to have z to the power of x multiplied by y, right? So when we go ahead and do that, what we're going to get, say we have x is, say x is 3, say y is 4, that means that we would have z to the 12th, right? All right, so our next equation that we covered yesterday was the difference of squares. So we've got difference of 
squares. All right, so the difference of squares, we remember that that was when we have x minus y times x plus y. So when we do that, we know that we are going to get x squared minus y squared, right? Because we're going to do that x times that x, we're going to get x squared minus y times y. That's going to give us minus y squared. We know that we're going to have minus y x, but also we're going to have that plus y x, and those will cancel. So there's our difference of squares. And then our next equation that we covered was trinomials. We have both positive perfect squares and negative perfect squares. We got trinomial, and well, this one will be our positive perfect squares, All right? So you can think of this as if you have an x plus y squared, what is that going to give you? You know that that's going to give you x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. Now, our negative version of this, right? So our negative perfect squares trinomial. That's going to be the opposite. So that would be if we have x minus y squared. And we know that that is going to give us x squared minus 2xy and then also a plus y squared. All right, so now we go into our equations for today. Those were all the equations that we covered yesterday. Now we can go ahead and get into the equations that we have for today that we have not learned yet. All right, so the first one that you need to recall or be able to know has to do with imaginary numbers. So imaginary numbers, they are labeled i, right? So let's say we have i. Well, i is equal to the square root of negative 1, which means that i squared is going to equal negative 1. i cubed is going to equal i, and i to the fourth power is going to equal 1. So one thing that you also have to know is that if you multiply or add 4 to each one of these, so say we have i to the fifth, i to the fifth is also going to equal negative 1. i to the sixth is going to equal negative 1. i to the seventh then is going to equal i, and i to the eighth is also going to equal 1. So that's another thing that you have to keep in mind when working with imaginary numbers, is that if you add 4 to each one, then you can go ahead and find what it's going to equal. So what we need to know about this is there's going to be times where we have to eliminate imaginary numbers to get a real number. So what we're going to do to do that is understand that we have to multiply by the conjugate. All right, so we have to multiply by the conjugate. All right, so what's the conjugate? So let's say we have a plus, we'll say, a plus x times i, i being an imaginary number. And we have to get rid of this imaginary number, right? Well, that means we're going to multiply its conjugate, which is going to be a minus x i. Now, when we do that, what we're going to end with is going to be an a squared. We see that our plus x i times a and our minus x i times a are going to cancel each other out. And we're going to have that x i times minus x i, which is going to give us minus x squared. But then we're also going to have an i squared. We recall that i squared is negative 1, which means that we're going to multiply our negative x squared by negative 1, which is going to flip that to a positive. So we're going to have a squared plus x squared, right? So that's going to be the equation that you're going to want to put in your notes. It's going to be a plus xi times a minus xi is going to equal an a squared plus an x squared. So that is the equation you want to put down. We call that the complex conjugate, right? That's how we're going to get to a real number from an imaginary number, right? You also should write down these rules right here for imaginary numbers. I would recommend having those down. I'm not totally sure how often these i to the fifth and above will show up on the SAT, but these will, these i one through fours. So I would make sure that you include those in your notes. They may not show up on every SAT test, but it's helpful to know just in case, especially I squared. I squared is very important to know. Star that one in your notes. Make sure you know that I squared equals negative one. That way you can get rid of it to get to a real number from a complex imaginary number. All right, so the next equations that we're going to be getting into, they deal with financial models. And then after the financial models, we'll get into some statistics, right? All right, so the first financial model that we're going to get into is going to be exponential growth and decay. Exponential growth and decay, right? 
And this isn't just with financial models, particularly exponential growth and decay that can happen in science. You can see something about carbon, right? Carbon decay. So this one also is in science, not just financial models, right? But there is also, you can have exponential growth and decay in finances as well, but also science for this one. But then the other ones are going to be more to do with finance alone and less science. So exponential growth and decay. What is the equation for exponential growth and decay? That is going to be y is equivalent to a times 1 plus or minus r to the power of x, right? So we need to define a, r, and x to understand this equation because we have to understand these equations. So a is going to be our initial value. So what do we have at first, right? So our starting value, our initial value or starting value. Right. Now r, r is going to be r, how much we are growing or decaying, right? So if r is positive, right, so we, we have 1 plus r, that means that we are experiencing exponential growth, right? So if r is positive, we're experiencing exponential growth, and if r is negative, we're experiencing exponential decay. So let's say that r was equal to, let's say 10%, right? That would mean that r would be 0 0.1 because we're increasing by 10%. That's going to be represented by 0 0.1. So we'd have 1 plus 0 0.1, and that would be 1.1 to the power of x. So r is going to be our rate of growth if positive. So I'll say if greater than 0. And then it's going to be our rate of decay okay, if it's less than 0. right? So if r is negative, that means we'd have 1 minus r, which means that we're going to have a decay. And if we are growing, that means we're going to have 1 plus r. So it's going to be our rate of growth if it's positive, our rate of decay if it's negative. And then x, x is going to be our time, right? So let's say that x is one year, right? So let's say that we grow by 10% every year, then we would have 1 plus 0 0.1 raised to the power of 1. If it's one year, after two years, we would have to raise that to the second power, three years, third power, all of that. So x is going to be our time, right? So an example would be, let's say we have... The amount of money accumulated starting with $1,000, right? And let's say we grow by, we'll say 20% each year. So we have 1 plus 0 0.2 because 20% can be represented by 0 0.2. And that's going to be raised to the, let's say we want to know how much money we have after five years, right? So we'd go ahead and plug that in. So when we do that, we're going to end with 1,000 times 1 1.2 to the fifth. And that will tell you how much money you have at the end of that five years, right? So the equation you need to have in your notes would be all of this, right? All of that, because we need to know what A, R, and X represent. Okay, so now we're going to get into more financial models. That one right there, it's very, very likely you'd see that as a science question. You could also see that one as a finance question, but the next couple are going to be specifically dealing with finance. All right, so we've got types of interest. So types of interest questions, they can show up fairly often on the SAT math section. So now we've got types of interest. There are two types of interest, two types. You've got your simple versus compound. So your simple interest happens once a year. It's very basic, you know, and your compound interest can happen quarterly or semi-annually, bi-weekly, anything like that, where you're compounding it over time, whereas simple takes place at one time. All right, so let's go ahead and use the equation for simple interest. Okay, so for simple interest, the equation that we're gonna use is gonna be A is equal to PRT, right? So T is gonna be our time, R is going to be our rate of interest, and P is going to be our principal amount or our starting amount, right? Principal amount or starting amount. So principal amount or starting amount. I'll go ahead and write that in. This will let me. All right, it's not working. Okay, so principal amount or starting amount. 
All right, so let's say our question was, how much interest is, man, this is not working. All right, how much interest is owed on a $1,000 loan at interest rate, let's say 5% after, we'll do three years without compounding, All right? So what without compounding means is that we aren't adding in our interest after each year and taking interest on top of that, All right? So we're not on our first, whoa, so on our first year, Let's say that we gained that 5% interest, right? So on $1,000, that 5% would be $50. We're not then taking interest on that as well because we're not compounding that interest. All right, so the amount that we're going to owe, we took out that $1,000 loan. So how much interest is owed? So that's another key part to pay attention to. We're asked how much interest is owed, not how much in total is owed. So the interest is going to exclude that initial $1,000 loan. All right, so what we're going to do then is we aren't going to do 1,000 times 1.05. We're going to do 1,000 times 0 0.05 because we aren't including the value of that initial loan. Now, if we were including the value of that initial loan, it would be 1.05, but we're asked for how much interest is owed, not how much is owed in total. If we we're going to do in total, we would have to have that 1.05. So after three years, so then we multiply by our three years time, and what we're going to end with then is $150. That's how much interest is owed. Now, how much is owed in total? That would be that full $1,150. All right, so now we got compounding interest. Compounding interest. Equation. So make sure that you have your simple interest equation in your notes. That's going to be A equals PRT where T is the time, R is the rate of interest, and P is the principal amount or the starting amount. Keep in mind that if you're asked for the amount of interest that's owed on the loan, that you don't include that one, you just use that zero point and then whatever the rate of interest is. But if you're asked for the total amount owed, then it's gonna be that one point and then plus whatever the rate of interest is. So keep that in mind. All right, so for our compounding interest equation, it's gonna be A is equal to P, P being our principal amount, A being the amount in total, is equal to, or I'm sorry, multiplied by, all right, there we go, multiplied by one plus R being our rate of interest over N, which is the number of times that we are compounding it, raised to the power of NT. All right, so now we'll go ahead and write out what each of those represents. We got P being our principal amount or our starting amount, right, so the amount of the loan, principal amount, then we've got that one, one just represents the one. We've got R, R being our rate of interest, right? So our interest rate, interest rate, N being the number of times that it's compounded during one T, right? So if T is a year, then N is the number of times it's compounded per, per year. If T is each month, then N is the number of times it's compounded per month, right? So N is gonna be our number, of times compounded compounded per one t right and then t is just going to be that the amount of time right so if t is t being our unit time all right so let's give an example here what is the we'll say how much interest or how much we'll do in total this time. So this is in total. So we're going to include that initial principal amount that we took out. How much in total is owed on a $1,000 loan at, we'll say, 6% interest. So I'm going to do IR for interest rate. So 6% interest rate compounded. We'll do two times per year. We'll do after, let's do, we'll do four years. So after four years. 
All right, so let's take a look at our equation. We have A equals P. So what's P? Well, P is going to be that initial $1,000 loan. All right, and then we're going to multiply by 1 plus our rate, our interest rate, which is 6%. So 6% is going to be 0 0.06, all over the number of times we're compounding each year, which is 2, all raised to the power of the number of times we're compounding per year, which is 2, times our number of years, which is 4. So 2 times 4. All right, so if we go ahead and solve that, that's going to give us 1,000. And then we're going to have 0 0.06 over 2, which is 0 0.03, so 1.03 all raised to the eighth power. So that would be our answer for the total amount owed. Now, what if we were asked not for the total amount owed, but for the interest owed? Well, then we would drop this one here and we would have that 0 0.03 raised to the eighth. All right, next equation. So now we are done with our financial models for the most part. Um, there certainly could be an average in the financial models, but generally we're dealing with simple interest and compounding interest are going to be our two big equations there. So that's the end of financial models. And now we're going to get into statistical analysis, right? So statistical analysis for the SAT math section is not all about equations, right? So we've got statistical analysis on the SAT math section. All right, so this is all about statistics, right? So the SAT math section, not every question you have to actually do math for. Some of it is just making sure you understand how to accurately formulate conclusions based on statistics, right? So part of that, we'll start with the equation, and there's really only one equation other than that exponential growth and decay that you kind of need to know for statistical analysis. As far as simple statistical analysis, there's questions that can make you use math with statistical analysis, but there are also questions where it's just a word problem and you just have to be able to sit, talk about random sampling and random assignment. But the equation that you will need to know for statistical analysis is going to be the mean, right? So the mean is also the average, right? Mean is also the average. So those two can be used interchangeably. Now what that means is it's going to be the sum of everything all over your count. All right, so that's a simple way to think about mean. But if we're going to write that in equation form, we could think about it like this, right? Let's say that we had a plot of data, and let's say we have we had to solve for the average age, right? So we have age, and then let's say we have number of people, right? And we're asked for the mean age. So we have, we'll say we have five-year-old, ten-year-old, and a twenty-year-old, and that's not drawn to scale at all. So I'll write not to scale. Right, let's say that we have one, two, three, ten year olds, one twenty year old, and one five year old. So we have to solve for the average, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that five, right? Because we have one person who's five years old, we do five times one, then we have a ten year old, we have three of them, so three ten year olds, ten times three, and then plus one twenty year olds. So we got twenty times one. Now we gotta divide that by our total number of people. We see that we have five dots, which means we have five people. So we're gonna divide by five. Now when we do that, we got five times one, that's gonna give us five. And then we have 10 times three, that's 30. And then we have 20 times one, that's 20. Keep in mind, this is all over five. Five plus 30 is 35, 35 plus 20 is 55. We got 55 over five, which is equal to 11 is the average age. All right, so that's how we would do an average if it were given to us in a problem set, is the average age. So the equation that you're gonna to wanna to put down then would be something like sum over account, right? Your total over your count, and that would be how you do it. All right, next equation, or I'm sorry, not equation, because we're doing statistical analysis right now. So the next concept that you're gonna need to know, so I'm gonna star this, this is a concept, not an equation. Concept, not equation, right? All right, so this is for statistical analysis, keep that in mind. We're talking about things where they would show you a table or a graph and you have to be able to tell or even a word problem where they just talk about a study, anything like that. So you have to understand random sampling, right? So biased samples, what causes biased samples, why are they biased, what makes a good sample? All right, so random sampling, let's say, or I'll wait to give an example. I'll just more give a definition right now. So random sampling, let's say that 
you have a sample that you have to take for a study. What is the best way to take it to make sure that it gives you an accurate representation of an entire population that's unbiased, right? So with random sampling, the goal is to have an unbiased and reliable sample. Right, so let's say that we are, I believe that there was a question on a practice test that talked about having the average, this isn't a direct quote because I just remember it, but it was about the average um, children per household per household in a city, right? So this polling agency wanted to determine the average number of children in a household in a certain city, and they took this at the playground, right? So they did this sample from families at a playground. So what's wrong with taking the average children per household in the city, but taking all of your samples from a playground? Well, the problem is that it's not random, all right? So it's not random. And as a result of it not being random, it's biased, right? People who attend a playground or bring their kids to a playground likely have more children, right? Because if you don't have children, you're not going to bring your kids to a playground. So you can have a household without children, and that's not going to be included then because you're not going to have brought them to that playground. So you're going to end up overestimating that number of children per household in a city if you don't use random sampling and you take it from a playground. So that's going to be a biased survey. So what we want to do is we want to take a random sample of everyone in that city, all right, so we want to take that random sample of everyone in that city, and we could do that by drawing random numbers based on social security numbers, uh, drawing random numbers based on phone numbers, making random phone calls to be just based on random phone numbers, right? We want to keep it as random as possible to avoid having bias in our sample, right? So if we use random sampling, we're eliminating bias, creating a more reliable sample of data. So you can put that down in your notes for random sampling. And then the other thing that we're going to need is we're going to need to have random assignment. Right? So random assignment is probably new to you because it's not necessarily taught a ton in school or at least not by this name. Right? So random assignment. So what is random assignment? Random assignment is the second part of random sampling. So we have random sampling and that takes place. So we have our sample. Right? So step one is that we have a random sample. Right? So a random sample is unbiased okay now step two we have to make sure that we don't turn this random sample into now a not random assignment of treatment so let's say that we have a drug right and we need this drug to be tested to treat cancer if we take everyone from our random sample and we divide them based on if they have diabetes or not then we no longer have random assignment because we've assigned them based on a category so if we want random assignment, we have to randomly assign treatments and controls. So randomly assign, randomly assign people to the different groups, All right? So we can't pick who goes in what group based on a trait because then we don't longer, we no longer have random assignment, right? So for the example of this cancer drug, we would want to give everyone a random number and then draw random numbers and split each one. So let's say that we had, let's say we have 200 people. So let's say we have 200 people. All right, so we have 200 people. We give everyone a random number. So everyone gets a random number between one and 200. Give everyone a random number. Now this doesn't mean we go down a line of people and go year one, year two, year three. That would mean we have to randomize the people and then give them those numbers. So we give everyone a random number right, then we are going to randomly draw 100 numbers. So we randomly draw 100 numbers, and the first 100 numbers that we draw then would go into one group, right? So that way it's random. So we need to be able to randomly assign our treatments, right? So one half of the group is gonna be assigned a control treatment. And if you don't know what a control treatment is, a control treatment, go ahead and star this, control treatment, 
a control treatment is not an actual treatment, right? Or at least not in the sense that you're adding something, right? You're just keeping it basic and it's control treatment is used to make sure that there is no placebo effect. So that's another thing that you should know is the word placebo effect. Make sure there is no placebo effect. All right, so what's the placebo effect? The placebo effect is when someone thinks they're getting a treatment, so they think that they're getting better, but they actually weren't given anything. So what we wanna do is if we're doing a study like that with a drug, we wanna split it into two, two groups. We wanna have a control group who receives a placebo, which is a treatment that has nothing in it, right? So there's no actual treatment, but they think that they're getting it. And then we want to give the other group the actual treatment. So that way we can compare the two together. So that control treatment is the group that doesn't actually receive a treatment. Right? And that way we can control for the placebo effect. So that's going to be your statistics for today. And then, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more, one more, one more part of statistics we need to know. And that's going to be standard deviation. So standard deviation, there is a formula for it, but you don't need to know it for the SAT. So I'm going to go ahead and put that here. You don't need to know formula. If you take AP statistics, you might know the formula. You don't need to use it on the SAT. And don't use it on the SAT because it'll waste time. So don't need to know. Let's go back, don't need to know formula. All you need to know about standard deviation is basically how to apply it to a plot of data. So let's go ahead and do two plots of data real quick. Once again, let's do age, and let's do number of people. Number of people. All right, so let's do five, we'll do 20, and we'll do 35. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw do a bunch of people centered right around 20, right? We see that we have lots and lots of people who are just about 20 years old. Okay, and then in our other set of data, let's go ahead and do age. And let's say that we have 5, 20, and 35 again, right? And once again, that's number of people is our dots. So now let's say that we have an equivalent number of people and we have it spread out like this. Okay, so standard deviation. Standard deviation is a measure of how far we are from our mean or our average. So if we look at our average in this first, I'll go ahead and give a one right here. All right, so this is gonna be our graph one. This will be our plot two. If we look at plot one, we see that our average is going to be at 20, just about, right? And we see we only deviate a very small amount to each side, right? We are very, very centered around this average. So we're all very, very contained. We don't deviate, right? We're not deviating very far from our average. So that A is going to be average. We see we aren't moving very far from it, right? We're very, very close to our average with all of our points of data. Now, if we look at in contrast, we look at number two. In this plot, we see we have that same average, A, but look at how much farther we're deviating. We see we have points that are very, very far away from our average. So the standard deviation, so I'm going to write SDEV for standard deviation, is greater in 2 than in 1. And that's pretty much the extent to which you need to know standard deviation for the SAT. You really only have to be able to apply it to a plot like this. I've really never ever seen it kind of shown in anything other than plots, tables, and graphs. So as long as you can identify with standard deviation that something like this where we're deviating farther away from our mean, that means that there's greater standard deviation. And when we're deviating less from our mean, that means that there's less deviation, right? So we got less standard deviation. And then over here we have more standard deviation, right? So when all of our data points are very concentrated about our mean. That means that we have a low standard of deviation. When they're very spread out from our mean, that means we have a high standard of deviation. So that's gonna take us through the statistics section of our SAT math equations and formulas. And for the statistics section, just general knowledge of that. And then tomorrow we'll get into our other equations. Our other equations are gonna start getting into geometry. So we're gonna be talking about shapes, talking about circles, equations for circles, all of that good stuff. So make sure to tune in tomorrow and we will go ahead and get into the SAT reading section for the rest of today. 
All right, so we just got done with the math section for today. So now we're gonna go ahead and get into the SAT reading section. So we spent about 35 minutes on the math section. So I'll try to get this done in about 25 minutes to keep it at about an hour for the day. So today we're gonna get into the SAT reading week one notes. So these are gonna be notes that you should take in your notebook for the SAT reading section. So the first thing we need to understand is what we need to know about the SAT reading section. So what's important? Well, for starters, we need to understand what kind of test we're taking. We have 52 multiple choice questions. We have A through D, which means we have four possible answer choices. So we're not dealing with five. We're only dealing with four answer choices. We have 52 questions. We need to understand how much time we have, right? How long can we spend reading? How long can we spend answering questions? So this test lasts 65 minutes. Now, if we do the math, that means that we have 1.25 minutes per question on average. Now, why does this matter? Well, one thing to understand about this is it's actually less than that, right? It's 1.25 minutes per question on average, but that doesn't include the amount of time that we spend reading the passage. So we actually need to be answering questions faster than that, right? We actually need to be answering questions in about under one minute on average because we have to take time to read that passage. All right, so what else? Well, if we split that 65 minutes up over the five passages that there are, that gives us about 13 minutes per um, that, yep, so we got 13 minutes per passage, right? That says per question set, that's not per question. It's talking about that set of questions, which is about 10 to 11 per passage, right? So we have 13 minutes per passage, but if we use all 13 minutes, then we can't go back to check our answers at the end because that would take us our full 65 minutes. So in reality, we really wanna be getting done with each passage in about 10, maybe 11 minutes at the most because we wanna have about at least eight minutes, 10 minutes to go back at the end. So we've got five passages in total. You've got two social studies or history passages. So if you're strong in social studies and history, you have good contextual knowledge of that from AP US history or things like that, that could help you. It won't necessarily help you. What's gonna help you the most is understanding strategies for the reading section. But you, if you're strong in social studies and history, understand you're gonna have two passages based on that, so that can help you. If you're weak in social studies and history, understand you're gonna have to work a little bit harder on those sections then. And then you also have two science passages, right? So the science passages, personally, in my opinion, I like the science passages because you're dealing with things that have good evidence. So you can use evidence to support your answers on a lot of those questions. So it's tough for you to make errors like you may on the literature section in judgments of tone or things like that. So if you're someone who's a very STEM oriented person, those two science passages are where you should look to get perfect scores on for those two passages. You should see a science passage and you should say, okay, I'm strong in STEM, I can get these ones down correctly, right? So if you're strong in STEM, strong in history, but not so much in literature and poetry and things like that, not that there's actually poetry passages on the SAT, there rarely is, I don't think I've ever seen one, but if you're not strong in literature, understand you got two passages with STEM, two passages with history, you can make sure you nail those four passages if you're, if you're weak in literature. All right, so usually one of the passages on the SAT reading section will have two passages. So what does that mean? Well, generally, let's say that one, let me switch to my pen. Let's say normally you have one passage, right? And it's all from one text. And let's say that it's 90 lines, right? Let's say that it was 90 lines. Well, then on one section out of those five passages, right? One of those passages will be split into two, right? So you have two passages in that one section of about 10 questions. So now you're gonna have two, right? And each one, so you have two passages, but each one will have about 45 or 50 lines, right? And keep in mind that I just am showing you that it's about half, right? I don't know exactly how many lines there will be or anything like that, but I'm just showing you it's about half, right? So one passage will be 45 to 50 lines, other passage will be 45 to 50 lines. So it'll come out to usually a little bit more than one passage, when it's split up into two like that, but it's still not anything crazy. So understand that. And then what those passages will be is you'll have to be able to compare, contrast, and analyze each of those two passages, how those authors' perspectives differ, how those authors' perspectives are similar, and analyzing what kind of evidence they use, what they allude to, things like that. So it'll be asking you to do a lot of comparing between the texts, right? So you usually have a couple questions that are specific to one passage, usually passage one to start, and then you'll get a couple questions that ask you to relate it to passage two, and then usually a couple that ask specifically about passage two, and then once again, questions that relate them both. So just, I'll go ahead and say it right now, what I tend to do on those where there's two passages like that, is I will read the first one first, 
I'll answer the questions that ask only about the first passage. Then I'll go ahead and read that second passage, answer the questions that relate only to that second passage, and then I'll go back and answer the questions that were asked about both of them. So that's what I would recommend for those two passage, those two passage SAT reading section questions. So there's my recommendation on that. I'll get more in depth on that at a later date, but you can go ahead and write that down for now because we're only going to be spending three to four days per week on the reading section. So it's not a ton of time, whereas with the math, we're spending a lot more, but that's okay because the reading section is only worth a quarter of it and math is worth half. All right, so what's tested on the reading section? So the number one thing you're going to be tested on is your command of evidence. So what does this mean? Well, the nice thing about command of evidence is you should be using it anyway with your answers. You need to be able to support your claims, right? That's a big, big thing with the SAT reading section. There's going to be a lot of questions where you have to make a claim with something about something. It's not just you making up a claim, but it's you making a claim about the text, right? So say that the author is writing an, an essay about why teens need to get more sleep, right? And let's say that the question asks you, what is the author's main claim in the last three paragraphs, right? You have to go through, find what his main claim is. Let's say that his claim is teens are only getting six hours of sleep. They need to be getting nine hours of sleep, right? So you identify that, then you have to go back and you have to find the evidence that supports that the author's main claim is that perspective, right? So here's the thing about your command of evidence points is that these should be easy additional points. And here's why. Any answer choice that you're choosing should be supported by the text. What a lot of people fall into as far as traps on the SAT reading section is they fall into a trap of mindset, not even a trap set by the SAT, but they start to think, oh, both of these questions or both of these answer choices could be the answer. And the truth is only one answer, only one answer choice can be correct, right? And I'll admit when I first studied, pre started prepping for the SAT and taking practice tests, that was a struggle for me, right? I'd get to these reading sections, I would be between two answers, right? And then I'd get done with the test and I'd be thinking to myself, well, both of those could have been correct or, okay, I got this one wrong, but my answer was right. Don't think that. Right from the jump, understand your answer is wrong if the SAT says it's wrong. Whatever the SAT says goes, only one answer choice is correct. And here's the other thing. Even if you're thinking, oh, well, the SAT can be wrong. No, it can't. And here's why. If the SAT was to pick an answer choice for the reading section that was ambiguous or broad or could not be supported by evidence, then they would be sued, right? There would be parents who would have their kids who they thought were going to score perfect, didn't score perfect. They'd be suing. There would be big, big problems. They would have to cancel questions. So understand that when they make these questions, they make sure it can be supported by the text. Every single answer choice that they choose is because it's supported by the text. And every answer choice that they say is wrong is because they can support that with the text to show that it's wrong. So you always want to be thinking about textual evidence and about proof. Proof is everything on the SAT reading section. All right, so your next thing that you're going to be tested on, the next thing you'll be tested on after your command of evidence is going to be your ability to interpret words in context. Right? If you've ever taken an SAT practice test or the PSAT, this is going to be the infamous no, or I'm sorry, the infamous most nearly means questions, right? So you'll be directed to a line, say that it was line 63, and the question could say, in the context of the passage, what does the word, let's say, what does the word turning mean in line 63 or something like that? And you have to answer what that word most nearly means in the context of the passage. So keep in mind, context may not mean only that sentence. Context may mean a couple sentences back and looking at the big picture of the passage. So you have to be able to interpret what a word means based on the context surrounding it. So when it directs you to that line 63 in that word, you need to go back maybe a sentence, maybe two sentences, maybe three sentences, and make sure you understand the context surrounding that word. Don't just select, do not just select the synonym, right? Let's say that the word is good. That doesn't mean that you should select great, right? You don't want to just pick words that mean the same thing or mean similar things. You want to go through, take a look at the context, and then use that context to come up with your own answer, right? Context matters. Context is everything on the SAT reading section. The next thing, this is big, come up with your own answer first. Now, if you're starting out and you're scoring below 1,000 on the SAT, then I wouldn't recommend going ahead and coming up with your answer first quite yet. Not quite yet. Eventually, I want you to start doing that once you get better at answering questions. And in particular, I was talking about on the reading section with this, right? So if you're killing the reading section, yes, come up with your own answer first. But if you're getting 
more than half of the questions wrong on the reading section right now, then coming up with your own answer first may not be the best idea quite yet, right? But if you're getting more than half of your questions right on the SAT reading section, then coming up with your own answer first can be a great idea. And here's why. The answer choices, they can sway you, right? Let's say that you come up with your own answer first and you read the where let's say you don't come up with your own answer first, right? Let's say that you just go ahead and read the question and you look straight to the answer choices. That's when you're gonna get stuck between a couple because you're gonna think, oh, this one makes sense, but this one also makes sense. And then you're stuck between two. But let's think about it the other way. Let's say that you came up with your own answer choice first. Let's say you looked at the question and it directed you to go do something, right? Let's say that it was talking about lines We'll do 55 to 60, and it's about what was the purpose of these lines? Why did the author include this quotation, right? So you read the question, you go back to the text, you look at the lines, and you come up with your answer based on the context around those lines as to why the author would include it. So now you have your own answer. Now you look at the answer choices. You find the answer that aligns with what you chose, and you select it. Now you, let's say, let's say that you're not 100% sure in that answer but you came up with it first and you selected it. Now you look at the other answer choices. By coming up with your own answer choice first, if you get stuck between the two, you can at least go with the one that you chose first because that's likely the one that's most supported by the text because you just dug around in the text. Coming up with your own answer choice first is gonna make sure that you're not stuck between two. And oftentimes, if you come up with your own answer choice first, you may not even need to read the other questions or the other answer choices, right? You may still want to, but if you come up with your own answer choice first and that question, or that answer choice is exactly what you came up with, it's likely that you're right if you're already scoring well on the SAT reading section. So I would highly recommend coming up with your own answer choice first, especially with questions that are most nearly means questions, right? So words in context especially, highly recommend coming up with your own answer first. All right, next big tip, finding three wrong answers. This is huge for the SAT reading section, right? You wanna make sure that you're finding three wrong answers. So what does this mean? Sometimes finding three wrong answers is better than finding one right answer. Because the SAT has four questions, or I'm sorry, I keep saying questions, because we have four answer choices, right? Four answer choices. If we can get rid of three of those, right? If we get rid of three, right? So we'll do A, B, C, and D. Let's say we can get rid of A because we looked at it and we said, okay, there was one part of that sentence that isn't true and isn't supported by the text, so I can get rid of that. We look at B, we say, that's an unrelated topic. I can get rid of that. Now we're between C and D, right? Let's say we read C. C sounds very, very good. We read through C, we get to the last four words of it, and it sounded like the perfect answer, but then in the last two words or the last word of it, it says something that doesn't line up with the text, something that isn't supported. That means we get rid of C, even if the rest of it's correct. Even if 99% of that answer choice is correct, have to get rid of it because 1% of that answer choice is incorrect and unsupported. And if any part of your answer is unsupported by the text or unclear or untrue, we have to get rid of it. We have to be ruthless in how we are getting rid of answer choices. Okay, if any part, if one part, if a single word of a answer choice is incorrect or unsupported by the text, you need to get rid of it. And that's gonna help you stop being stuck between two, two answer choices, right? Because you can get rid of all of them or all of them but one, right? So anything that is wrong in an answer choice means you have to get rid of it. And that's gonna help you stop being stuck between two or three. All right, so data analysis. This is the next thing you're gonna be tested on with the SAT reading section. So what this does not mean is that you have to do math on the SAT reading section. The SAT has a math section and it has a reading section. Those two are not going to really cross in that way, right? But what it does mean is you need to be able to analyze data successfully. This is in particular talking about tables and graphs pie charts, data plots, things like that, but more so tables and graphs. So how, however, you will need to be able to interpret these tables and graphs, right? So you have to be able to interpret them. That doesn't mean that you're gonna have to be able to do math from them, right? If you're given a table, you likely are not going to have to, I don't think that you will even, I'm, I, I would be shocked if you ever had to do this because I don't think I've ever seen it, but you should not ever have to do any math with a table or graph. What you should have to do though, is look at the graph or table and then it might give you the percentage and then use that percentage to answer questions that relate to the text, right? So an example question could be something like this. You're given a graph and this graph we'll say is the amount of minutes that people watch TV based on their age. And let's say in the passage, the author was saying that teens spend the most amount of time watching TV out of any age group, 
And let's say that the graph showed that the teens were indeed watching the most TV out of any age group, right? And let's say that that number was that 70% of teens watch TV for more than four hours a day, right? And then the other numbers showed that all other groups watch TV for less than two hours a day. And the question was, which part of the graph shows that the author's point about teens watching the most TV per day of any age group is supported by the graph? And then that's what you pick for the graph, right? So that's more so what you're going to see with tables and graphs and questions like that. So then you're going to take that data that's in the graphs and the tables, and you're going to apply it to the passage to support, refute, or compare the data to the information in the passage. So it will rarely, rarely, rarely ever be just you interpreting the data, but it's going to be applying that data, right? So you're going to be able to take a table or graph. You're going to have to interpret and analyze the data. And then after analyzing the data, you have to apply it to the passage to support, refute, or compare it with the author's argument. So this is going to be covered in practice problems, and you'll kind of see more of what it's going to look like when we get to those. Additionally, reviewing in the math section with practice problems there is also going to help you be able to interpret tables and graphs. So that's kind of one nice thing is that those tables and graphs, they show up on the writing section, the reading section, and the math section. So if you're good at interpreting them, that's going to be very, very beneficial to you on the SAT. So like I said, some crossover the crossover with the writing section here and that you have to be able to analyze data and apply it to the writing section and the reading section, right? But you're not going to have to do math with that. All right, so some successful strategies for the reading section. All right, so here's the thing about the reading section, right? Everyone reads differently, so there are multiple approaches you can use. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean every approach is as good as other approaches, right? There are obviously some approaches that, in my opinion, work better for most people. So obviously everyone's different. There are certainly people who can score perfectly on the reading section with a different approach than someone else who scores perfectly on the reading section, right? So everyone's going to be different with this, but I have my recommendation on what I think works for most people or would work the best for most people. Now, don't think you have to use this because everyone's different and you can use trial and error on practice tests to see what works best for you. But this is what I would recommend for people who are just beginning. Obviously, you want to try some different things out. If you want to try different strategies out before you decide on one, that's obviously fine. Fantastic. But here's what I would recommend for most people if you're wondering where to start. Number one. The order you read the passages in can matter significantly. So this isn't really something that you're going to find out for a while. But after taking a few practice tests, you'll kind of get a feel of which passages you're better at, right? So over time, you're going to take practice tests. and You're going to acquire data from those practice tests and from practice passages, because we'll do practice passages in the course. And that's going to tell you in what order you should do these passages, right? So for me, the literature section, this is how I did it. The literature, section, the literature section was my hardest, right? So that was my hardest section. The science sections were my easiest, right? So the two science were my easiest. And then my history and social sciences were in the middle. So what this meant for my strategy is I'm going to draw this up top here as I would go science passages first, then I would go to my history passages and I would complete my literature passages last. Because what I would find is that I would often get stuck on the literature section because I'm not super great at interpreting sarcasm and things like that, right? So I would always make sure I did my literature section last. I would do my science sections first, history sections second, because I always found I could move quickly through the science sections and I could always find the right answer relatively quickly because I was more of a concrete and fact-oriented mindset and thinker, right? So that was the order I would do it, right? I went my easiest to hardest. So that's what I want you guys to do once you figure out what's easiest to hardest, right? In the beginning, you might just want to go straight through because you might not have an idea. If you have an idea that you're already much better in STEM and you're not great at literature, go ahead and go STEM history literature. If you find that you're better at literature, start with that. And if you find you're bad at sciences, end with that. But you always want to go your easiest to your hardest. Now, you got to make sure, though, if you're going to do that, that you are filling in your bubble sheet with the questions you're on, right? All right, so now if we're talking about the actual passage now. So we've determined our order, how we're going to go through it. We're always going to go through easiest to hardest. So now we're going to read our passages, right? So what does that consist of? So if you're using my strategy that I recommend, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify our easiest sections and do those first. 
The next thing that I'm going to recommend is that we read the passage. So I don't recommend that you are taking notes on every single paragraph in the passage because that's going to take too long. But I also don't recommend that you just quote unquote skim over, right? I don't want you skipping lines or skipping information because you don't think it's important. Don't try to, I'm sorry, that says predicate. That should say predict, okay? That should say predict. I'm going to go ahead and cross that out. Got predict. All right, so don't try to predict anything. Right, so you're reading through it. Don't try to write notes predicting what's going to happen later on because if you're wrong, you just wasted your time. If you're right, congrats. You would have learned that anyway without wasting your time writing it. So it sounds harsh, but it's the reality. We're not going to try to predict. We're not going to skip lines. Right? Our feelings about the text don't matter either. Okay. We do not care about whether or not we like the text. We care about understanding the text and utilizing it. That being said, other tip as we read through, we're going to make sure we're staying interested. That's huge. If you're reading an SAT section for the reading section, you need to make sure that you think that that's the most important thing on your mind right now and that your love and joy is what this reading section is. So if that means that you're a literature lord and you're super good at literature, but you're reading a science section, for that day, you're a biologist who's super interested in how frogs how frogs uh, survive. Okay, You got to make sure that you're super interested in whatever you're reading for that three and a half, five minutes that you're reading it. Okay, Because that's going to help you remember it. It's going to help you have a better understanding, be able to recall details better, where things occurred in the text, and it's going to help you get a better score. So you got to stay interested. Next tip is going to be don't reread on your first read through. So if you read something as you go through this passage and you don't understand it, don't take time to reread it because you might not need to know it to answer your questions. So that goes back to not predicting. That's huge. We don't try to predict on the SAT reading section ever. We don't try to predict answer choices without textual evidence. We don't try to predict what we're going to need to know on our first read through, right? So if we don't understand something on our first read through, we just keep going. Okay. If we have to understand it later, that's going to be because there's a question on it and we'll have to go back anyway to find answers or to find evidence to support us. Okay. All right. So my next tip is going to be to write little to no notes as you go through your first read through. On your first read through, you're just trying to identify the big picture of the passage, right? And remember where things are. So you're not going to write really, I personally, I wrote very, I wrote no to maybe one or two notes, maybe. Usually it was no notes, just underlining evidence sometimes. And that was as I read through, never pausing as I read, never, ever pausing as I read. I read straight through. I would underline things as I read it if I thought it was important sometimes. So not taking time to write notes really at all. In my opinion, I would use symbols if you want, underline if you want, but I would recommend not taking a ton of time to annotate the text. So in my opinion, and this is also kind of just doing the math, you should really be finishing reading that section in less than five minutes. So any passage you have, it should take you less than five minutes to read it as pretty much a rule, I would say. Preferably, it's nice to finish it in under four minutes and even more preferably about three and a half. I think three and a half minutes to, I think about three minutes, three and a half minutes is probably just about ideal. If you can do it in less than three minutes, that's great. If you're doing it in less than two minutes, you're probably moving too fast, but there are some very quick readers who can do that. So three and a half minutes to three minutes, I would say is probably ideal. Under four minutes is still good. And then if you're under five minutes, then it's still possible to score well, right? Some people are slower readers. That's okay. If you're doing it in under five minutes, you're, you can still be okay as long as you're quick with the questions. If it's taking you more than five minutes, you should work on your reading speed a little bit. And that's my recommendation there. All right, so now we've got approaching the questions. And I think we're actually going to go ahead and save approaching for questions tomorrow because at this point, we're at just about an hour. So it looks like we will save the approaching the questions section for tomorrow. So just to recap very quickly, if we go back up, we covered what you need to know in the reading section. So we talked about pacing on the reading section a little bit. We talked about what passages there are. We talked about what's tested. So be tested on your command of evidence, your ability to interpret words in context, and your data analysis. Data analysis is usually at the end of the passages. I'll mention that as well. We talked about strategies. So obviously everyone's different. There's multiple approaches. I'm giving you what I would recommend for the most people, for, right? So for the common man, in my opinion, or common woman, I would recommend that you read in the order of easiest passages for you to hardest passages for you. I would recommend that you do a simple read through in under four minutes, preferably. As a rule, I would say under five. 
you're not writing a ton of notes, just kind of underlining or doing symbols, but never pausing, never stopping reading, just kind of staying reading through it and staying interested. And then we're going to get into approaching the questions on not tomorrow, but in two days because we have writing tomorrow. So tomorrow is going to be math and back to writing. So thanks for watching. The link will be in the description for the donations when that link is up. So if you appreciate the videos and they're helping you out, please donate. These videos take a lot of time, take a lot of effort, just like me prepping took a lot of time and a lot of effort. So certainly would appreciate any donations. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.